You're listening to the This Is Horror Podcast, The Bay. Welcome to the fifth This Is Horror Podcast. I'm Michael Wilson. I'm joined with my co-host, John Costello. Watcha. And my other co-host, Dan Hauer. Evening all. So today we're going to be discussing The Bay... And following on from that, there will be an interview with Conrad Williams. We'll be discussing Conrad's fiction, his approach to writing, and the apocalypse theme, which is in both The Bay and various works of Conrad's fiction. Let's kick it off then with a synopsis of The Bay. Okay, The Bay is set... And based around the time of the 4th of July celebrations in 2009, it features an outbreak of what may be a virus, could be a parasite in the water that affects the residents around that time. And where does this take place, Dan? Around the Chesapeake Bay area of Maryland, Very focusing good. specifically on the town of Claridge. So I think the, the first thing we should probably talk about is that it's a fan footage film and that there are multiple cameras being used uh, to convey that and whether or not we think that worked. Well, there are so many found footage films that you want any new entrant in the genre to try and do something a little bit different, a little bit special, a little bit of quality coming through. And I think that The Bay manages to do this. I'm a fan of certain found footage films. I like Blair Witch Project quite a lot. Um, I liked... Cloverfield a great deal. I liked Wreck. And so when you get a multiplicity of different cameras that are all being stitched together to tell the tale, to show the tale, so you've got police camera footage from the cars, you've got mobile phone footage, you've got video camera footage, you've got amateur filmmaker footage, you've got onboard boat footage, etc, etc. There's a lot of things that are um, being edited together to get this narrative as a kind of almost a tapestry and I think that that approach works very well overall um, it certainly helps to add tension there's a lot of wobbly cam in it but for once there's a justification for that rather than it just being a style choice of course it is a style choice mm. but it's got a reason for being and I liked it a great deal so I've been watching a few interviews with Barry Levinson and he said there were 21 different digital formats in filming and no degrading and I think that definitely adds a sense of credibility and believability to it all. Interestingly the part which is filmed on the iPhone with the 15 year old girl that was all just <laughs> filmed on her iPhone um, so Levinson would be in, in another room. She'd do her recording and then go and bring it to him and they kind of keep going back and forth. Cool. What did you think to it visually, Dan? Uh, I enjoyed the way that, you know, it chopped and changed between the different formats. Um, I thought the use of Skype conversations in it um, was pretty good in a scene towards the end. I quite enjoyed that. Um, it's putting me on edge now because we're talking over Skype. <laughs> um <laughs> Are there parasites uh, yeah, but, in your living room, Dan? Yeah. Oh, shit. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, that, that was something that I enjoyed about it, to be honest. Um, the various different perspectives, the use of archive footage as well, um, you know, added a, another level of believability to the whole thing, really. And I thought also the way that it was edited together, um, bearing in mind that it is a young girl in a room telling the story and mm. narrating, you know, what is essentially her documentary of her experience over that weekend um, I thought the way that it was all put together in that sense it was believable you didn't think that there was you know too much I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't make it sound like the editor has no skill but it was edited in a way that you could believe that she had put it together if that makes any sense which I suppose in itself is a skill of course there is one slight problem if you're looking for full logic which you can't do in a horror film as we've already pointed out many times but and that is when you get a lot of different camera positions you get a lot of different angles when they're trying to put all this coverage together then you get some impossible ones that you notice them creeping in and it's like oh that couldn't have actually existed 
And then if you're trying to keep the almost documentary realism sense of this reality taking place before your eyes being catalogued from the testimony of the people that were there and the mobile phones, the iPhones, the cameras of the people that were there, you get music coming in, non-diegetic music, soundtrack music, and of course, you know... What are you going to do? Should you do it with music? Should you do it without music? And it's these style choices that I think, you know, that they probably just about managed to walk a tightrope and get right. But some of the impossible camera angles and some of the music cues were probably something that I just... In the end, I wish they'd done a little less of. Minor quibble, because it's, you know, it's an entertainment piece after all, and they're not trying to be 100% documentary realist about it, but... When you bring music and you bring impossible camera angles into the mix, then I kind of think that you lose a little bit. I think to get away with putting a soundtrack in a found footage film, it has to be a pretty good film. And I think luckily for the makers of The Bay, it is a good film. And so you can allow it that. You can almost afford to know that you know, that, that is an impossibility. I thought in terms of the way that it was made, it was objectively a very well-crafted film. One of the things that I particularly enjoyed about the format and the way that this film was set out um, was was the fact that in a lot of found footage films, the thing that takes me out of the story or what's going on is the constant thought of, why the fuck is this person still holding a camera in this situation? And I think by setting it up almost as more of a documentary than you know, a single person on a camping trip filming what's going on. I think, you know, there was was no moment in that where you thought, you know, what is going on with this guy still holding a camera whilst the city burns around him or while zombies do, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. You know, there, there was no moment like that in the Bay. And I think that is massively to its credit because although I love found footage films, that is my one constant criticism. And it was something that I didn't think you could really level at this one. And one of the things with The Bay, in terms of its documentary-like feel, so initially Levinson was asked to film a documentary on The Bay. It wasn't actually meant to be a film. So he looked into it and then found that Frontline had already filmed a similar documentary and he felt that it was so complete that you know, there was nothing that he could really add. So he had to think, well, how can I approach this? To get the message across in an original way, he decided to keep that documentary feel, but to add more of a, a narrative and to essentially turn it from a factual documentary into a piece of cinema. Well, you don't associate Barry Levinson with horror. No. I mean, you know, I like I loved Barry Levinson's first film, Diner, mm. um, and I've liked a lot of things that he's done since Tin Men, for example. I like a lot, but um, you don't associate with him, him with working in this genre, and so I think it kind of stands out when you get a director who's very clever, who knows what he's doing, who can bring the project together and put it out there in big quality. Because I think this is a really good quality piece of filmmaking. I think that considering that it's a found footage film, the, the scripting is is very tight. To what extent that was made up in the edit suite, I'm not sure. But, I mean, obviously they had to have a very strong plan of the narrative beats of trying to get the the thing working as a story and to try and get all the shocks in in the right places, etc. Yeah. To get the characterization as they could try and get it, because obviously it's very difficult to get excessively good characterisation when you're dealing with fleeting glimpses of different people coming constantly back and forth. Yeah. And so, you know, I thought that the the, the stamp of quality is all over this movie. I think that it it does deliver on the shock factor as well Um, because I think one of the questions that Michael was going to ask was, you know, to what extent is this a horror film? That's exactly where I was going to lead in from. <laughs> cool. So, would would you say that it it's it? I mean, I'd say it's it's the best seafaring horror film since Jaws. I mean, I I think that we're going to probably come up with this question again and again whether what we're reviewing is actually horror because there are so many things which cross over. For me, this is horror. So this 
Yeah. Horror. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it, you, it, would it, you it, classify Jaws as a horror film? I would personally. Yeah, I think it's it's again one of these films where it depends on your definition of horror. But you know, us, this is horror. We approach that in a very wide kind of way. If it's about characters in a horrific situation, then chances are that you know that that is horror. I think Hitchcock would have liked a film like this a great deal because, of course, it would have been a, something that he would have loved to have been able to do in his day. And when it's all about setting up suspense and tension, which is what The Bay does very effectively, I think, you know, you get the classic horror moments, you get the, the you know, the corollaries to the Jaws moment of the body under the boat, you get that kind of when the oceanographer is attacked under the water which is you know you're not expecting it and it's a really clever moment because it's yep. so fast and fleeting you get kind of classic allusions to other horror films which I think we'll talk a bit about later so it's not just about the ocean aspect of this there are also little set piece scene sequences in there that remind me of other horror films which I think are clever and knowing winks to the genre yeah and I think it takes a good governing intelligence to do something like this and to bring it off well without it seeming like a pastiche or seeming cheap. And there is one thing that I also enjoyed about it as well is there's no kind of, you know, you look at a lot of kind of monster films, I suppose, you know, big monster films, Godzilla being, you know, the preliminary one. Mm. There's no big money shot here as well, which is often a problem, you know, particularly in terms of, you know, how suspenseful is Jaws until, you know, you see the shark jump out of the water and you're watching it with somebody and they go, well, that's just a fucking big model of a shark. That doesn't look realistic at all. There's nothing here in terms of that that really takes you out of the suspense that's built up because it's let down visually. I think it's, you know, it's done quite cleverly in the way that, you know, everything that's under the water is hinted at more than blatantly seen. I think that's much to the film's credit. You mentioned monster movies, and I think this is effectively the realistic equivalent of a monster movie. This is taking that idea, but removing all of the kind of bullshit, all of the fantastical, and a lot of the things that ruin a monster film. Yeah, have yeah. been removed. <laughs> it's a monster film redux, isn't it, Rin? To some extent. And so the, these isopods, these are uh, these are real. Um, you know, it's not something that Levinson has just conjured up. <laughs> a lot of the shots are CGI, but then there are also shots within it which are genuinely the real deal. And I think, again, that that's to be used to his credit. Well, it's a film with a message, isn't it? I think Mr DeLacy would love this movie because it's the real, genuine eco-horror angle. So there's a, there's a, a governing reason that these isopods have um, their evolutionary cycle has been increased has been accelerated and it's to do with the way in which the bay has been used in terms of the desalination plants the chicken farm that borders onto it putting the waste into the water particularly to do with the steroid content of that and there are all these quite plausible reasons given for why these things would have actually come to a kind of stage where they become very dangerous to humans and that it's something that we've caused ourselves and it's a cautionary tale in that respect and I think that that aspect of it is also handled very well because it doesn't hit you across the head like a big message hammer Yeah. although it is still very much part and parcel of the way in which the movie is kind of asking these questions about what are we doing out there yeah, I tell you what, Colonel Sanders must be shitting himself <laughs> watching this. Oh, he, he'd still end up in the K KFC, wouldn't it? Oh, without a doubt, yeah. But you know, <laughs> just, in, <laughs> just in terms of going out to visit, you know, KFC sites, I'm sure he'll be sat in his ivory tower. Yeah. What the fuck am I on about? He's a fictional character. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's how believable it is. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Uh, yeah, I love KFC that much. I actually <laughs> believe the Colonel is real. It hasn't put me off, actually. Where else are you going to get your steroids from? Well, exactly, you know. They're not that easy to come by. <laughs> Look at me, I don't go to the fucking gym, do I? <laughs> so we're talking about the eco-horror. I think what makes it effective is that it's real. 
rather than or realistic you know, you know a, yeah. an eco warrior coming up with some fanciful disaster which isn't actually a threat to us but one of our followers on facebook tim burke said that he felt that it was perhaps a little bit too preachy in its message do we think that and if we well irrespective is it worth preaching about well, I think there's a bit of a difference between impassioned argument and preaching, and I think the film probably works on the right side of that divide. What do you reckon, Dan? Uh, I agree. I mean, it wasn't something that I came away with thinking, you know, that would have been good if it wasn't for the lecture in the middle. You know, it's not something that I thought an awful lot about in terms of the message that it delivered. I think the suspense and, you know, the overall kind of... I mean, I guess in in a lot of respects, it is quite a frightening film. But it wasn't something that I came away thinking, you know, oh, there's a real lesson to be learned there. It was something I came away thinking, oh, shit, I've just drunk some water. What am I doing? You know, like, those are the kind of things that would la- live with me from the film rather than the message, I think. So, you and know, maybe funny, that's... The funny thing is that there was separate. a scene in it where the, where the, the mayor is standing up and uh, saying, you know there's nothing wrong with the water the water's absolutely fine it's the best water in the world and he takes a big drink from best a glass of water, water in the world exactly yeah. <laughs> and it reminded me a lot of when we had the bse scare in this country and the conservative minister john selwyn gummer made his daughter eat a burger on camera and said there's absolutely nothing wrong with our meat supply you know and this mm. this stuff happens and i like the fact that the the film was kind of taking these this real life aspect of it you could say that it's slightly stereotypical but these things have happened in the real world and i did quite appreciate that another thing i thought about the the bay was that it's the latest in a very long line of quite subversive films with an inherent understood message without it being as i say megaphoned as a message that your government is your enemy that they are keeping things from you that they are trying to hide stuff that they are engaging in practices or allowing practices to happen without being regulated that are harming us and then trying to hide the aftermath of all of that and to hide their own incompetence as well exactly so you know if you think back to the x-files the x-files tv series ushered in this kind of very skeptical we don't trust our government and then you look at all the narratives that are very popular that have done so none more so than Homeland recently, which is very, very scathing about the American political system and the government's complicity in all of these kind of atrocities. And I think that the way in which the Bay engages with that and just kind of takes it as read that the government is going to try and suppress all of the details of what happened in this little town on of Claridge on July the 4th, 2009, it's, it's just understood that this is how it is you know and i liked that it's very much a post 9 11 film isn't it it's not the kind of you know the message that it carries in that sense Mm -hmm. isn't necessarily something you would have seen from a film of this nature pre 9 11 in my opinion well exactly because we've all become slightly more cynical and hardened off to the realities of real politic haven't we yeah exactly but i think that's definitely something that has opened up a lot of more interesting kind of subtexts to films and that's personally something that I quite enjoy me too in a film I must admit and I don't think it's too preachy or too over the top in its message if something's too preachy then it actually takes me out of the film because I'm thinking I'm being hit over the head here with the message. It's a little bit like in a Megadeth song where Dave Mustaine, halfway through, decides to go on some crazy political rant. Not necessary. I mean, I think that another aspect of the film is that it it does have that kind of knowing touch about delivering horror effectively delivering suspense and tension and shocks effectively there are some set piece scenes in this film that i really like um spoiler alert possible here but i think that the the nod to jaws or the probably numerous nods to jaws are very cleverly handled and nicely done nicely delivered i think there's a a a particularly cronenbergian 
kind of feel to the first few appearances of the isopods when you can't really quite tell what they are and they look like a cross between a cockroach and a turd. <laughs> And that's they look very like much uh, trilobites, don't they? Yeah, that's very much in uh, Cronenberg territory, circus shivers and rabid and things like that. And then I think there's a uh, probably my favourite scene in the film is the one seen through the uh, police dash cam, yeah. where the uh, one policeman remains in the car and the other one goes into the house. And it just reminded me of the opening sequence of Dawn of the Dead, but done at such a remove, because in Dawn of the Dead, of course, you were in that basement with the SWAT team and looking at all of the horror that they were discovering, whereas in The Bay, it's cleverly done at from outside the house, so they've enhanced the audio, as they tell us on a caption, to hear what went on inside the house, and then you get the policeman going berserk and trying to shoot everybody simply because he's trying to put them out of their misery. Very cleverly done, seeing that. Do you right. think the the fact that the director hasn't really been involved in any horror films before is to his benefit here? In Almost the, certainly. The film hasn't fallen into you know usual tropes or stereotypes that you often see in horror films because that that scene could have been incredibly gratuitous and could have undone a lot of the hard work that the rest of the film has done. But let's you know, face I was it. going back to talking about the money shot of the monster before. That would have been the ideal time to do it in a hack's hands, wasn't it? Wouldn't it? You know, but exactly. But you think about then the difference of approach between Levinson, who's constantly happy to let the story unfold at arm's length, and a director who might have thought, "Oh, this is a great opportunity to get some blood and guts up the walls." May May I make this? Um, I've, I've thought about this as soon as I finished watching the film. Um, I don't know if you guys have caught the trailer for World War Z or World War Z, depending on what country you live in. I have, yes. Uh, with Brad Pitt. And have you have you read the original source material? Of course. It's brilliant novel being about to be ruined beyond all hope. Exactly. In the hands of somebody like Barry Levinson, I think that would be, you know, the bait is the prototype for the ultimate World, World War Z film, in mm. my opinion. You know, it's subtle, it's understated. You still get the complexities of, you know, the people involved and you get to know them a bit, as opposed to the trailer that we have currently seen. I mean, you can't always judge a film completely by its trailer, but, you know, we're, we're seeing some sort of action, you know, shoot em up fest when I feel that this kind of approach to that film would make it an absolute world beater. Well, no doubt we'll have to do a post-mortem on... Uh world war z at some future point on the podcast yeah um but you know i know a, f a friend of mine's been working on the vfx crew on that film for a long time now and he says it's the car crash of all car crashes oh god that's the, that's literally the last thing that people that have read the book are going to want to hear isn't it this is coming from someone who's working on the film as yeah. well yeah <laughs> it does not bode well Shit. no I mean, you know, we can save all the World War Z stuff until it comes out, but I'm yeah. pretty certain that it is going to be the disaster that everybody's predicting it will because, of course, it's not being made for an adult audience anymore, which it started out as being, but now is not. I don't know how long that podcast will be, I think. I mean, it, we can probably take this audio and then put it <laughs> on at the time, but yeah. it will probably be welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. We're reviewing World War Z. Don't watch it. Okay, <laughs> next time. <laughs> okay. Here's what we said about it several months ago. Yeah. Before it even came out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, that, that was something that I thought while I was watching it. I just thought this would be the ideal way to make that movie. Mm. I mean, I, you know, I thought it was subtly done and, you know, that that scene from the cop car, as you say, was the standout scene for me. You like, you know, I, yeah. I thought that was absolutely brilliantly done. Yeah, really well done. And there's a good payoff scene to that later, which I won't reveal because that's too much of a spoiler. But they dealt they deal with the way in which the events of that scene so traumatise the police officer that it's just kind of brilliantly handled payoff. Yeah, and yeah. I, those two scenes are my two favourite films. <laughs> uh, two favourite scenes of the film. So it, this is quite a contrast then. We were disagreeing all the time in the last <laughs> podcast and we've even agreed on our favourite scenes. <laughs> I also thought the scene where the couple on the boat finally come into dock um, at, the, at the, the jetty and they're walking <coughs> and they're expecting the, far, the 4th of July fireworks to be going off and mm -hmm. everything's completely quiet and they're wondering why the hell they've missed the celebrations and surely the fireworks and the display should be in full swing. And then they start walking through 
the outlying parts of the town and then they get into the middle of the town I thought that that sequence was very very well handled as well yeah because the silence it could, it, helped it could have been very very flat because obviously you know in and of itself we all know what's already happened but the way in which it was shot it was quite beautifully shot I thought with the handheld camera and when they come upon they start coming upon the bodies and then they think you know what in the name of God is going on here um, and that sense of tension and, and distress was palpable so where do we think this fits into the found footage uh canon and you know, how would we rate it amongst its peers within the genre I think it's as good as Wreck to be honest which would be my yardstick uh, yeah I'd agree I think Wreck has to be up there as probably the best found footage film in my opinion I mean the thing about the found footage film and you know as a subgenre, you know it's one that I particularly enjoy I think it can be very very effective when it's done right as it is here and it is, as it is done in Wreck. Um, but in the hands of a lazy director, there's also nothing worse. So, I mean, I think the yardsticks in terms of Wreck and to some extent the first Paranormal Activity was one that I enjoyed as well. I mean, the yardsticks are very high, but the average for found footage is actually quite low. But Can you I'd give say me a that, few examples of what you mean by average or low quality ones? Because I haven't really seen that many, and I tend to have seen only the good ones, fortunately. Uh, yeah, I tried to pick them out. Chernobyl, Chernobyl, Chernobyl Diaries was one that no, didn't really do anything for me, I've got to be honest. Um, subsequent paranormal activity films. Uh, Grave Encounters, I must admit, didn't do a lot for me, although I know a couple of people that did enjoy it. Um I think when you think of found footage films, you know, I, I find it hard to pick out, you know, amongst some of the dross, you know, you, you're clutching at straws really because it is a lazy or almost a poor man's in terms of budgetary uh, filmmaker's technique. So I think when you're looking at a found footage film that has this level of quality and originality to it, I think you've really, really achieved something if you're standing up there out of, you know, what can be classed quite often as a mire of found footage films what do you think of that michael i've seen a lot of found footage films and whilst you were saying all that i was desperately trying to think of the names of some of the really bad found footage films but i'm really struggling to come up with a single one which i think you know really shows that that these ones that aren't any good they they are almost throw away they're instantly forgettable one thing i can say actually have you seen them um, marble hornets on youtube i haven't no no I, I would advise you to check that out gary mcmahon put something about it on facebook it's um like a serialized youtube uh i guess you could kind of put it as a documentary i suppose but it's all serialized into a hundred or so different episodes right uh, just type marble hornets in okay and that's that's really well done actually that's cool. another one that you can check out for free which i think is is right up there in terms of fan footage have you seen vhs uh no i haven't actually yeah that's one that kind of i thought was going to be better than it was but has got some great moments in it overall yeah, i really enjoyed vhs i think the the positives outweigh the negatives so i'd, yeah, I'd, I'd certainly that. recommend it i know there were some people that just didn't get on with it um nothing divided people more than the blair witch project so mm. it's, well, it tends true. to be the way with found footage films doesn't it there's a lot of people i mean i know that john llewellyn probert doesn't like um the bay very much which i kind of you know i don't know why but i'm sure he has his reasons yeah, well, we'll have to talk to John and find out the specifics. Yep. Uh, but I, I mean, probably for me, my my favourite found footage films would be Wreck, would be The Blair Witch Project, and I think would be the original Paranormal Activity. I think with the first one, I came into that pretty cold. I didn't really know what was going to happen, and so it actually meant that you know, the, the scares really work. I think it helped that I was watching it you know, in my apartment, lights off, sound up, <laughs> late at night. And then the contrast, Paranormal Activity 2, I saw that at the cinema because I'd enjoyed the first one so much. Well, I think that was a mistake for a start. Mm. 
loads of fucking annoying people there. <laughs> well, actually, I watched um, the first one in the cinema, and I think it, you know, it, it did a lot for the experience. That's one of the few times I've been to see a horror film in the cinema and come away feeling that, you know, I benefited from that experience. Uh, people, there were girls in front of us even screaming at the end when it says, you know, Mika's body was found a week later. <laughs> Katie is still missing, and there's girls in front just, ah, oh my god! <laughs> you know, that's that was a great experience in terms of going to the cinema. I thought it was brilliant. But I think that the Bay is up there with anything that I've seen in this genre for sure. Well, and Oren think... Pelly is involved, isn't he as well? Sorry, yeah. yes. One yeah. of the things that I liked a lot about it, which you tend to get... A lot of found footage films operate under cover of night or darkness, so they're using lack of light, shadows, things lurking in the darkness to do the work for them, in a sense, whereas a lot of the bay takes place in daylight, broad daylight, bright sunshine. Yeah. And I thought that was an interesting contrast, and it worked very well. So from briefly looking at the reviews online this seems to have divided quite a few people as well and i i wonder if particularly within the horror community if um the complaint is is perhaps that these the horror elements which we kind of love aren't played up it's not gratuitous so perhaps that's just not found to be fun um i'm speculating because for for me it worked and to have done anything else would have been to kind of miss the point completely and to just take away from it and to make it a bit of a joke well it's unusual to see a horror film that's got quite a lot of depth and has got a good deal of skillful layering that as you say the horror elements aren't necessarily to the fore they're couched under delivery of a good strong tense storyline that's got plenty of suspense elements that's got plenty of other things just rather than just delivering the horror and i thought that that was you know something that was more intelligent than i was expecting it to be um i don't really care that it doesn't deliver all out gore horror because you know i wasn't necessarily expecting that and i didn't want it to do it anyway i think something that speaks maybe for the intelligence of the film overall is the fact that um, and that's what I was just looking up now. I saw it the other day. Uh, the, one of the reviewers on The Guardian gave it five stars out of oh, five yeah. and talked about what, you know, an intelligent film it was. Um, you know, and I think there's been a lot of horror films that I know personally that I've enjoyed that have been savaged by mainstream papers or mainstream outlets. So I think to see it get praise from the guardian as a newspaper is something that speaks volumes as to how it's almost transcended you know genre and, and certainly in what people expect of genre films anyway well there's a couple of um nice little re review snippets here that an unnerving eco disaster thriller that refreshes the found footage trend with surprising effectiveness that was the hollywood reporter a chilling tale of something nasty mutating in the waters thrilling and provocative screen daily um, a real creep fest joins the suggestive company of eco terror entries like Hitchcock's *The Birds* and 1979's *Prophecy*. Time out, New York, four stars. Jaws for grown-ups is what it says on the Guardian. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that you know the calling to mind films like *The Birds* and *Jaws* gives a, a good indication of what people who like this film think that its pedigree is. Yeah. Yeah. To hold it in that high esteem is. Uh... You know, that's all you need to know, really, in terms of whether you should go out and watch this film. So, unless we've got anything else we want to discuss, I think it's time to round up and you know ask whether we give the thumbs up or the thumbs down. I think people may know what direction we're going to go with this one. Yeah, an unqualified thumbs up. Yeah, I agree with that, jump. Yeah, thumbs up. A little more succinct this time. <laughs> <laughs> Three thumbs, all of them straight up. Yeah. Lovely. Your ass. Slightly crookedly up, but you know what yeah. I mean. <laughs> so, catch us next time and enjoy the interview. And now for a horror interview. I'm joined here with Conrad Williams, the author of the third This Is Horror chat book, The Fox. 
and an award-winning author for various novels such as one. Conrad, thank you for joining me. <laughs> thank you for having me, Michael. Nice to see you. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about horror writing and how some of our listeners can get into that mm. and kind of tips for aspiring writers. So I guess a good place to start would be how you first got into horror writing. Well, it was a long time ago. I think it was it was to do a lot to do with um, watching uh, black and white, oh, black and white films, scary black and white films um, with my mum and dad. My mum was really into uh, horror films and horror fiction. So yeah, I mean, I remember watching Night of the Demon, uh, King Kong, which really affected me a lot. The the original, of course, but and also the the very. Um, the very good films, a big influence were the um, the Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes series, which were a bit an- anachronistic uh, and and very much a kind of like a propaganda tool used by um, uh, the Ameri- the Allies against uh, Hitler. They came out in the forties, um, a lot of them, um, but incredibly atmospheric and, and very spooky. And um, there was one of them I can't remember what it was called now. It might have been the Pearl of Death. That had a character called the Hoxton Creeper. It was this oh, her- horrifically kind of ugly, broken nose, big hulking guy. I don't know his name. He was a, a terrific actor, um, but he used to uh, kill his victims by picking them up and breaking breaking their backs over his knee. That was great. Mm. Um, but in terms of horror fiction, it wasn't until I was about 12 or 13 that I started reading... Um, I, I read Stephen King and... Uh, uh, James Herbert because that was pretty much all that was on offer at my local um, bookshop um, but then uh, through Ramsey Campbell who, who was local to me I was living in Warrington, he was from Merseyside and I saw him reading on a few occasions and got into the English writers through him really and um, got more and more interested in, in uh, horror fiction and was, ever since I'd been writing stories at school was was tending to write kind of dark stuff so it was really a it was i don't know what it was but it was just i was drawn to it um and uh so that was how i got in, got involved in it um in terms of well nowadays there are lots of kind of like uh opportunities and, and markets um more so than when i was starting out um so i think it's just a case of reading it and, and not just choosing choosing the genre because you feel it's uh, it's going to be lucrative or it's it's going to be successful because horror traditionally isn't um, but yeah I mean write what you like and, and if it's horror then read a lot first because uh, I think reading is 90% of it really Why do you think it is that there are so many aspiring writers that don't read enough or, or or don't read outside the genre well yeah I think you put your finger on it there I mean reading outside the genre is just as important I think it's 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 wherever you can get good fiction um, and then if you want to write horror fiction that's that's fine but uh, you should be reading everything really um, I just don't think that there are enough people who are writers who read as much as they ought to um, I think writing is perceived as something that I mean the thing is that a lot of people who say they want to be writers don't actually get around to writing anything for a mm. start because they it's hard work you know you've got to sit down and put the hours in and, and, and stack the pages up and it's a lot of work uh, you know it can take you it can take you the best part of a year to, to, to uh, complete a manuscript and when people are, have got full-time jobs as well, they're coming in from work and they're tired. They have something to eat. They have something to drink. And there's something on the TV. Mm. You've got to you've got to definitely be disciplined. And a lot of people just don't have that level of discipline that's required. I think that's that's the first major obstacle that you've got to try and get over. And so, did you previously have difficulty getting into? a writing routine and if, um, if, if you did what kind of tips could you offer for I think combating? it's obviously one of those things that's different for for everybody it's, um, it's whatever works for you I think uh, I found that <clears throat> I I resented um, getting up in the morning and going to work and giving the best hours of the day away to 
a company that I had no real loyalty to. I mean, it, it was it was nice to be paid for for work that I was doing, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't fulfilling me. Uh, and so I found I was getting frustrated. I was coming home, you know, coming home on the tube, which took a long time, getting in, having something to eat, and then I'd just flake out. So I found myself um, kind of accepting that unless I change things, I wasn't going to get any work done, uh, or it's going to take me a long time to, to actually achieve anything. So I used to um, get up early, sort of six o'clock, and do a couple of hours before I went into mm. work. And I think that that can be enough to kind of shake you up a bit, and um, you can get an awful lot done. I mean, another thing that I found when when we had um, our first child, and I was kind of taking a taking care of him most of the time, uh, was whenever he had a nap in the morning for an hour. As soon as he was asleep, I would zoom away and get working. And and again, because you know you've only got a small window, you can get a hell of a lot done. And I, I think knowing that you've you've got a tiny amount of time in which to get some work done can be a real incentive so it's you know more so than having an um you know a full-time writing job when the temptation is to just kind of put your feet up and uh as graham joyce would have it uh lie around in loose garments (laughs) you know staring out the window and waiting for the muse to appear you actually find that you've got to sit down and get this work done otherwise that's your window for the day gone again I think there will be a significant amount of people who are listening who are in full time jobs Mm. and they they wish they were utilising those hours to write is there anything you did whilst you were in your full time job to kind of take as much advantage of that creativity that you were getting whether it was jot down little ideas at your desk or well yeah I mean it's um I always had a note notebook with me and I carry a notebook with me everywhere anyway um but uh uh, you know there are people who will do some work when they're supposed to be doing something else at work (laughs) Uh, and if you can get away with it that's fine but um you know people I mean I know Gary McMahon he uh He's got a full-time job, but he he works in his lunch hour. Uh, he works when he comes home from from the office, which is you know it's amazing to be able to do that. But if you can, and, and you know get it get it where you can, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I keep a notebook with you, and um, you know you're not going to get sacked if you you have an idea and you scribble a few mm. things down. Um, I used to I used to do work. I used to write fiction when I was at work. Um, once I'd got my deadlines out of the way, mm. you know, I, it, it, it's good because it, it makes you look as if you're actually doing something when you <laughs> you got your head over the screen. So I don't know, it's it, it's it's difficult, but I think you just got to find find the space and the time that you can. So let's talk about the the new chat book which you've recently written for this as horror, the fox. Can you? tell our listeners a little bit about it and the muse for it yeah it's um my wife is a a travel writer and every now and again she gets us a little kind of like uh freebie so we might get to stay in a a nice london hotel or Mm. we might have a weekend away somewhere um that we you know it's 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 all it's all free but she has to end up writing writing it up one of these little freebies we had was uh, a glamping holiday mm. uh, in France. Uh, I think I think it was. We've also done one in uh, the New Forest as well, which was I think it's Featherdown Farm who do it. But anyway, it's um, for those who don't know what glamping is. It's uh, it's it's actually a mashup of the words glamorous and camping. Uh, so <laughs> you get to stay in a, a tent. But it's really more like a kind of canvas house, mm. and it's uh, it's really nice actually. They're kind of like you have a cool chest, this is a wooden box that you can put all your kind of um, uh, fruit and vegetables, and um, and you have a, a little kind of oven and nice beds. Um, our boys had a, a little kind of like cupboard bed, which is like a little is a mattress that's stored or stowed away in a little kind of like alcove which they really really loved uh and it's it's great you know there's a big uh, communal table and you 
you have to get a fire going in this oven and, and, and uh, in the stove and cook on it uh, which is the, the biggest kind of like challenge is getting this fire going and keeping it going because it's um, it's it's pretty tough tough work but it's in the middle of uh, countryside and it's usually um, part partly uh, it's on a, a, f- a field o- owned by the farm mm. uh, the farm has a deal with the company who allow them to they allow them to erect these tents on this thing and they get a cut of whatever's whatever's going um, so we we had this for about two or three nights and um it was uh it's an it's an amazing experience but it is you know it's quite strange because we had like a uh it was uh spring last year i think and it was pretty bad weather very windy we woke up and it was icy and snowy and just realize how kind of like exposed you are even in a place where you think it's quite comfortable so it was quite brutal and uh, and they had um, a little kind of there was a lake and a, a chicken coop and you're allowed to go and pick eggs in the morning mm. and one day we'd gone out uh, for a little walk around and we found a dead fox uh, next to the lake and I just I, I just it all kind of connected to there and then really I had this mm. idea that it would be nice to write about nature that wild aspect about nature that kind of like brutal aspect um and use the fox as a way in um this kind of like cute animal that people see as being kind of like um you know associated with fairy tales and Aesop's fables and all this kind Mm. of thing and um I, I, I find foxes quite horrific actually though um they're one of the, the wildest creatures I think I've seen one up close in, um, in, a, in a, a zoo in France where they have these animals like the badgers and stuff they have like kind of real wildlife animals not the kind of prettified you know stuff you find in a normal zoo and it was uh, it was behind some glass and it was it was just it looked like wildness personified it had this really kind of like weird look in its eye and um, it was aware of me but it wouldn't look me in the eye it was kind of like and really hunched up and it looked as if it was ready to do something and uh, that's always stayed with me and I just thought it would be a great kind of symbol for for what nature is all about really and then obviously uh, tie that in with with um, visits to uh, the woods back home when I was a kid and um, it was kind of tied together that way really it was just it was, I wanted to write about being in, in the middle of open spaces and mm. writing about family and, and fears that, about your family and that kind of thing. And of course, the main meat of the sto- story is arguably rooted within a childhood trauma prior to the actual yeah. glamping holiday. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, the, there was no such trauma. I mean, that's obviously all made mm. up. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, I did have, you know, I have friends who they had air rifles, and we used to shoot at fish in a barrel. But that was about as scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there was there was no kind of traumatic uh, uh, episode when I was a kid. But we did have these um, woods nearby that were actually they're backed onto Burtonwood Air Base uh, in Warrington, and. Um, I used to go. I mean, I've written about them in stories before. There's a story called Zombie, in which um, a, a boy and his dad go for walks in this place, and it, it was quite weird. I mean, it's all been built over now. There are, there are new houses and stuff. But when I was a kid, it was um, there were these weird little kind of sections where you would walk across tiled parts of on the floor, and quite obviously there'd been buildings there once, but they'd and they'd not been completely demolished the, the the floors remained or there'd be like little bits of um, strange pieces of glass and stuff and it was always a very weird uh, place to go but it was it was it was lovely it was it was wide and open and now it's it's just full of new built houses and um, it's pretty ugly now but it, back then it was quite a magical place for for a kid so the fox it isn't your first uh, short story you've got uh couple of collections out mm-hmm. you've written other shorter pieces for 
uh, the small press previously. Yeah. I wondered what different challenges you face when you're writing the shorter form as opposed to the longer and which you preferred writing. I, I, I don't know, really. It's weird. I, I, I love short stories because they were my way in to, to writing. I, I felt... Um, I felt no confidence whatsoever in writing a novel when I was younger, I, although I knew I wanted to do that. It just mm. seemed like such a huge job. Uh, but when I started out, I mean, I was only I was only about 17 or 18 when I had my first short story accepted, and and that was because I I um I worked my socks off one summer when I you know I'd finished school and um, second form second uh, sixth form sorry. I didn't know what to do. I'd failed my exams. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. And um, I just spent the summer writing stories and sending them off and getting them rejected and then I'd send them mm. off somewhere else. And I just worked really hard on it. And uh, I managed to get one published. Um, and uh, so I fell in love with short stories because I just... I liked that kind of, like, the, the, the speed at which you could get something achieved and then uh, try to get it out there. But... I think now I prefer well I don't necessarily prefer writing novels but it's it's what I want to be it's what I, it's what I want to uh try and get better at is writing novels mm. uh and obviously you know there's not much chance of having a career as a short story writer these days which is a shame but it, it it's just not it's not it can't happen so I I want to have a career as a writer and the only way to do that really is to is to try and write novels um but yeah, I wrote a lot of short stories, and um, I still enjoy doing that. But I, I don't write anywhere near as many as I used to. Would you recommend starting out as a short story writer for people who are just getting their feet wet with the writing trade? Yeah, I mean, I think most people do. Um, quite possibly because of the things that I just said. It's it's a it's a quick fix. You feel that you're as a writer you you feel as if you're achieving something uh even though it's perceived by many as being you know the hardest the hardest format to write in um there's something satisfying about writing a short story you don't have to spend years on it um so yeah i mean unless you and there are plenty of writers out there who've gone straight into writing novels and they've never written a short story in their lives but um you know, I love reading short stories, so why not? If you love reading short stories, why not try to do your own? And it is—it's an—it's—it's it's a way to kind of like serve your apprenticeship in a way, I suppose. And um, it can give you confidence uh, tackling a, a bigger project in the future. And a route which quite a lot of new writers are considering or taking is to go down the self-publishing route. What do you think? Are the advantages and the pitfalls of self-publishing, and is is this something you would advocate yourself? Oh, it's a tricky one because, um, I mean, I I grew up obviously in a, a climate in which you you write your story or your novel, and you send it off to a publisher, and you either get rejected or you get accepted, and uh, and. The, the way I see it is that if you if you write your own stuff and you yourself are deeming that material fit for others to see to, you, you are acting as your own editor then I think it can be slightly dangerous because um, you know a lot of stuff that gets put out there is not fit for human consumption mm. you know it's not good enough in terms of the way it's written or you know in, in terms of structure or plot or whatever there, there are lots of problems with it and I think that's why a, a good a good editor can be invaluable but at the same time I think that there are um, this idea of a gatekeeper at a publishing house who I mean entirely subjectively decides whether your piece of work is is good or not um, why why can't we all decide for ourselves so why can't we be the arbiters of what you know what is quality and what isn't so in that sense I think you know put it out there and let people decide for themselves but I don't know I, 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 I wouldn't like to say um, 
don't self-publish because I think that in many cases it's the only way that people can get their voices heard nowadays. Um, there are fewer opportunities, uh, fewer publishing houses. Um, so, you know, I think I think if you want to be published, the best thing to do is to look to the independents um, who are publishing excellent stuff. You're not necessarily going to get paid much, but then, you know, not everyone is going to be a Kindle millionaire either. Mm. So, you know, I think there are quite a lot of good independent publishers around um, like Sisara, like PS Publishing um, who publish good stuff and uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's another way in I think I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily like this kind of like um, quick fix where everybody can be a, be a writer everyone can publish their own stuff and you know although I think it's important that publishers um, don't necessarily. I mean, this this idea that publishers have these huge slush piles that never get read, which is unfair. But then, you know, I think you go too far the other way, and that's that's probably a bad idea as well. So, would you recommend that anybody looking to get their writing published uh, seeks out a literary agent because then you've you've obviously got a new way to get in. Yeah, I think. Um, I, agents, you know, the old way is still the best way. I think. I mean, publishers are still publishing good stories, good novels, uh, and agents are still looking for talent that they can represent. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would always say try to get an agent because an agent will do the work for you. That well, and, and that's another another uh, benefit I think of avoiding the self publishing route is that. If you're self-publishing, you're going to have to do all the kind of like PR and mm. you know publicity, everything that's going to eat into your writing time. So, isn't it better to try and keep as much time for, as possible for yourself writing the material and get other people to sell it and you know work on it that way? I think so. I think I, I, I'd rather do it that way than publish myself something which we spoke about earlier was social media and having a digital presence how important do you think that is as a writer and how can we ensure that we're using our time on social media and and through our blogs and websites effectively yeah well I mean as much as I say it's important that other people you know if you get, if you get the right agent and the right publisher they will do a lot of work for you it's also important to do a certain amount yourself um, and so yeah I think a, a blog is a good idea uh, I think that's a good way to connect with people mm. if, you, if you can keep it up I mean I, I've got one that I I try to write something new on it every so often, but probably not nowhere near as as frequently as I, I as I ought to. Um, but I'm, I'm that's ongoing, and I'm I'm trying to improve at that. But I'm a little bit unconvinced regarding uh, how efficient, how effective, you know, Facebook or Twitter is uh, for for the writer, uh, <clears throat> the you know the writer who is. I mean, not a, not an established professional because I know you know writers like uh, Neil Gaiman do very well out of social networking. But for me, um, I don't know. I, 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 it's difficult to to see how effective it is. Um, but yeah, I think some kind of presence, being um, available to to people who want to ask you about your work, is is a nice thing. I think and. Uh, it can be quite helpful. I mean, I've quite a few people have been in touch with me to ask me questions about books that I've written, and and I like that. I like that kind of like the um, the loss of separation between the writer and mm. uh, and the reader. It's a good thing. Yeah, and loss of separation <laughs> yeah, is yeah, available <laughs> for people to buy one of your novels. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a knowing smile <laughs> so what would you say are the ingredients for a good story and for a good horror story and is the answer any different no I don't think it is I mean obviously with a horror story there's there's an element of um, threat or suspense or 
um, you know, danger or however you want to describe it. But essentially, you, I think you've got to start with character and, and try and have a character that you can believe in and uh, feel for. Um, and after that, everything else is kind of secondary, I think. Um, you know, it's important to have a, a good story, obviously, but um, I think a lot of it comes from character. You can certainly, if you if you sketch out a character and, and build build him up, um, you can. Everything else can come from that. I mean, you, I've, I've sometimes, as an exercise, just written a kind of little potted biography of someone and mm. and gone into gone to a magazine to try and find a, a picture that that uh, suits the person that I've been thinking of. I'll clip that picture out and put it on the wall and uh, decided, you know, put him in a location uh, and bounced various things off him, other people, incidents, and you can you can find a story that way. Uh, I've not done that often, but it's worked for me in the past. But, yeah, I think character is the most important thing to, to, to find first. With a horror story, I think, um, ideally, if you can, if you can unsettle yourself... Then you're onto a good thing. Uh, I've only been able to manage that once when I was writing the unblemished. But um, yeah, if you can find, if you can, if you can unsettle yourself while you're writing, that's that's usually a good sign. But it's you know essentially it's kind of character, location, so that sense of place, uh, uh, an incident, an inciting incident. You know there are various ways you can go about it, but. Um, I think character for me is the most important thing. And a lot of your novels and work are character driven and the horrors within your work are real life horrors rather than you know, the more fantastical like zombies and yeah. vampires. And what is it that attracts you to this subject matter and what advantages do you think as a horror writer there are to, to be gained in writing about the real? Uh, well, I have. I mean, in one and the unblemished, uh, there is a, an element of the kind of like supernatural uh, in in the creatures that that we come up against. Um, but they're kind of. I mean, especially in the unblemished, I was interested in what scared me. I wanted to write a novel that contained a lot of what really bothered me, and one of those things was. Uh, um, mimicry uh, and the way that uh, I want I, I like the idea of the um, antagonists wanting to look like us evolving to look like us in an in an attempt to get closer to us because when you're close enough you can attack and I, I found that quite um, quite a frightening thing and I, I've always found uh, stories that have that kind of mimicry uh, in them to be the, the scariest things for me. Like you know, I mean, if you look at the, the the thing, the films, the thing, or or invasion of the body snatchers, it's that kind of. That's what they do. They look like us because they want to get close enough to, you know, kill us. Um, so that was that was important to me. Um, but the re the reality, I think, reality is is much scarier than anything that you can come up with. I mean, zombies and vampires and werewolves are all kind of interesting to a degree but uh, you know I'm, zombies don't scare me at all um, and uh, you know because it's not that they're just, it's just not going to happen but mm. the idea of somebody um, you know like a, a character in, in the unblemished uh, the, the, the whole idea of cannibalism of, um, of random violence really bothers me um, and, uh, and so yeah I find I find real events uh, much more frightening and, and if you can replicate those I mean it doesn't have to be 100% I mean one is predicated on a on a on a an event that could happen probably won't happen uh, and the second half of that is is populated by monsters that you know are, are complete fabrications and and but it's 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 uh, kind of rooted in in reality and, and in a world we can recognise so um, yeah there has to be an aspect of, of authenticity to it I think 
and one is your like big post-apocalyptic novel. A lot of writers seem to have like, at least one yeah. <laughs> in them. What, what do you think it is with the obsession of almost fantasizing about the end of the world and wiping out <laughs> all, all that are living? You're right. I mean, I, I, I'd always wanted to have a go at writing um, an end of the world novel. Um, reading uh, uh, Stephen King's The Stand absolutely adored that that book when I first read it um, and so yeah I've always been kind of fascinated by that and, and, and watching films uh, that have that kind of uh, post-apocalyptic feel to them it's, it's pretty fascinating the idea that you you are one of the very few survivors you know and how do you cope with that um, especially if as in one you've got you're separated from from a little boy that you you know you you love with all your heart uh, and you and you know is probably dead and and that's that's really where the story came from was was you have to you have to find out you couldn't you couldn't live your life thinking what if he survived you have to you have to go and find out so that was how the story came up for that but um yeah and and the the difficulty for me was uh, I wanted to write I didn't want to do a story about a post-nuclear war or uh, <laughs> killer flu or mm. something like that or plague I wanted to write, I wanted to do something a bit different and um, but I didn't want I didn't want to have to explain it uh, so uh, looking at it through the, the character's eyes the survivor's eyes uh, it made it a bit easier because, because you know, if he doesn't know what what happened, then how can anybody else? Uh, how can the reader know? So, I, the clue is in the acknowledgements, but um, I, and and they they surmise at one point what what might have happened, but uh, I didn't want to have to get into that whole kind of description of what went wrong, mm. but, you know, which would which would have taken you know another three hundred pages probably. <laughs> Uh, one question which I asked Joseph de Lacey la last podcast was if there are any listeners who haven't read any of your work before, which, out of all your back catalogue, would you recommend they start with, and why? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, Head Injuries, the first novel that I wrote, was... Uh, I'm very fond of it, but I think it's... Uh, I think it's a flawed novel. I think that it spends too much time kind of wrangling with itself over what it really is and and there's not as much drive. I, I was learning, very much learning how to write a novel and it, I think that comes across. Although there, I think there's some, some nice bits in it as well but um, it's very much a first novel. Um, London Revenant is... Uh, is odd because it was it's not really um, representative of what I'm doing at the moment but it's kind of I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in secret societies and uh, and that was about an underground tribe living in London and um, I'm not I'm not I'm not working on anything that's kind of similar to that now but it, it's uh, I think that's still worth a look uh, it's a very kind of urban novel um, and it's about identity and um, it's got some pretty good moments in it I think but yeah I think the best thing to start with would be um, one or uh, loss of separation because I think that's kind of pointing you in the right direction as to, as to what I want my fiction to be and where it's headed um, I also wrote a, a, a crime thriller called Blonde on a Stick which I'm really happy with and I'd like to write another containing the same character um, so yeah those are the three I think that um, are pretty much good pointers as to what I'm doing and what projects are you working on at the moment and what forthcoming releases with the exception of the Fox have you got uh, I've got a new uh, chat book coming out from uh, Nightjar uh, called The Jungle um, I'm working on a, a novel for 
Sony, which is a, a, a tie-in with a, a video game release that they're planning for next year, I think. It's going to be next year. It might even be a year after. Which will be effectively a prequel. It's quite an unusual step, but it's... Uh, it's an exciting one. They're gonna. It's not. It's not a novelisation of the game. It's gonna be. It's gonna act as a standalone prequel to their their video game, and uh, for which I help with the backstory. Um, so essentially, what's going to happen is that you you read this novel, and where my novel stops, the game picks up. So um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm also writing a, a novel set in France, which is a kind of haunted house story with a, a couple of twists. Um, and it has kind of like it's rooted in events that occurred towards the end of the Second World War. Um, and I've got a few more short stories in the pipeline uh, for um, uh, the Mammoth Book of Psycho Killers or something. I can't remember the exact <laughs> title, but it's about psychos. Mm. And um, another one of the uh, Innsmouth books that Steve Jones has edited. Um, I think it's called Weirder. Shadows over Innsmouth, uh, which is a Lovecraft related story. It's a big one, it's, it's about 11, 12,000 words called The Hagstone. Um, and other than that, I've I'm, I'm got things planned, but mm. not getting going until everything else is finished. Yeah. Really. <laughs> and do you have any final words of advice for our listeners regarding the writing craft? Uh, just, I mean, stick at it. I mean, don't get despondent. Um, it's difficult to difficult to say that, knowing that writers do tend to be quite sensitive souls. But um, it's important that you keep plugging away and don't give up. And um, try to do a little bit of work every day. Try to write something every day. Um, and that's the best advice, I think. Because if you do, if you write a little bit every day, even if it's just a, you know. Graham Greene hated writing, um, but he would all he would write five hundred words every day, uh, and when he'd written five hundred words, he would stop, even if he was in the middle of a sentence. And, you, and his manuscripts are covered with little numbers where he's mm. been counting, trying desperately to get to that five hundred. And sometimes it came difficultly, and, and other times it was easy. But he got his five hundred words done every day, and he wrote a hell of a lot of work over the time he was uh, active. Um, and those pages stack up quickly when you when you do that, and uh, it's surprising how much. I mean, you could write five hundred words in half an hour. Mm. So I would just say try and get a little bit done every day because it keeps you ticking over. It keeps that muscle flexed, and and you get a lot of work done. And it's easier. It's harder to stop, I think, if you if you're doing it that way. It's easier to stop if you're just writing a, a bit here and then leaving it a couple of weeks. And it's a, it's a lot more kind of optimistic if you can be doing a little bit every day that's my advice anyway and thank you very much to conrad williams we hope you've enjoyed the podcast if you'd like to get more this is horror updates then sign up for our newsletter on www.thisishorror.co.uk next podcast we will be reviewing american mary (laughs) 